couple of things. Uh, if I don't shake your hand today, it's not because I'm rude, but I think I might have a little bit of a sickness and don't want to spread the aloha. It's also why I have a, a flask up here. It's filled with coffee and get that on camera, Dallas Cowboys, go Cowboys. Um, but I hope I don't need to drink from it. I also want to just take a second to kind of brag on, uh, first of all, all of you who helped out with the marriage conference. Uh, I just, I think it was a really good experience for the people who went. I think they learned a lot. I uh, thanks Nolan and all the volunteers that, that put it all together. And I especially want to brag on um, Kyo and Laura Itakazu, who were uh, the couple representing the, the older season of marriage. And uh, they did a great job. And, um, you know, Laura started everything off like, oh, I don't, you know, I'm not the guy, I'm not the person who speaks on the microphone. But she did a wonderful job of communicating, I think, so many important things uh, um, I'm, I'm hoping it's all true uh, because I know a lot of people, you know, when they heard from them, they're like, man, I hope my marriage is like that when, when, when we're, uh, we're in our 70s and 80s. So uh, we, we thank you for that. Well, we've been um, going along this series of talking about discipleship, and I can't emphasize enough for you how important discipleship is. I really don't think about church in terms of the number of, of human beings that are occupying a space. I, I really think about church in terms of how many disciples are here, how many people are, are on that path, how many people are, are hungering for God's word, as we talked about, thirsting for, for righteousness, that they want to know and they want to be they changed. They understand that even though when they became Christians, Christ did this amazing work in their lives and they have the spirit they 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 they're not satisfied they they want to know more they want to be more like him they don't want to just know that someday they will be like him but they want to know now and it's not for themselves it's not just for their own personal fulfillment and their personal piety it's so that they can be better servants of the lord they want to be the best they can be um and that to me is what it means to be a, a healthy church, a church full of, of disciples. And we talked about last week about uh, salt and light and, and how what we do as Christians should be um, to, bring, to bring life to, to places, especially places that, that don't seem like they would, they would have life. Uh, something going on there? I'm not sure. The microphone. But also... To, let me put it in a different pocket, see if that makes a difference. Better? Um, but also light, and light is talking about revealing God, bringing his presence, and, and we do that, primary way we do that is, is how we treat one another, the unity that we have, the love that we show for each other, that it should be so different from what the world sees. And that's a question you, you, would, you need to ask yourselves because the, the idea of discipleship, it's, it's hard. It's hard for me to know, like, who's a disciple, who's not a disciple because I don't know what's going on inside as you're, or as you're trying to hear and learn and understand and grow. I don't know what the Spirit's doing in your life. But the second, the second question of, of a, a loving community, a community that that loves in a way that the rest of the world doesn't understand, well, that we can see. And that's the question we always need to ask ourselves, is, is, is that happening here? Not just with a few special friends I have, but is that happening here in our church? Do we know that? That's the healthy church. Today, we we're going to talk about this thing that when I was younger, I was kind of confusing to me because I would read in the Bible about how Christianity is not about rules and, and all, and it's about grace and faith. And then we'd come across passages like today, which, where Jesus says, I didn't come to get rid of the law. He says, in fact, not one iota is, is going to pass away. Not one little bit is going to be gone. It's like, okay, how can we be grace and faith but then the law is still here. And I didn't really understand. And, 
and maybe someone explained it and I just didn't understand their explanation. But it puzzled me for a while. <clears throat> and I realized later on kind of the, the brilliance of this from God. Because this is what happens to most of us. Most of us, we live under two um, masters, okay? Or we use these as powers in our lives. One of them is, I call it the tyranny of ambiguity. Ambiguity, what does that mean? Ambiguous. It means, you know, I don't give a really specific answer about something. I keep it kind of, kind of general. The, the meaning can kind of change. It's somewhat relative. And if you've ever worked for a boss who uses the tyranny of ambiguity, they never give you specific directions. They always tell you generally what to do, and then when you don't do it the way they want, they get upset. And of course, that could change from day to day because it's never specified, it's ambiguous. Well, some people like that. They like, they like to hear that Christianity is about love. Great. I'm going to stay with this ambiguous term, love. Don't tell me anything else. I just want to hold on to this love. And that's what they do. And so then they fill in the blanks about what love means and what love does. Uh, they, they, they get a general idea, and it's kind of, you know, in the ballpark sometimes. But they like it that way. And if all Jesus had come down to do, and if all Jesus said was, hey, just love each other, Love God, love each other. If that's really what Christianity is all about, that's really the message, people would have gone, cool, it's great. Now I can go define love. And I can make it mean whatever I want it to mean. But then there's the other tyranny. It's the one we think about more. And if you've had bosses like this, they probably drove you crazy. And that's the tyranny of specificity. That's the person who says every little thing down to, the, to the, the smallest detail and tells you everything to do. And you don't have any freedom to think. You don't have any freedom to interpret. It's simply, this is what you do. This is what you do. This is what you do. And some people like that. Some people don't like the tyranny of ambiguity. They start seeing how you're interpreting love and how it's different, how they interpret love, and they want someone to tell them exactly what everything is. It's a tyranny of specificity. Or maybe they're just kind of driven that way. They, they want to they achieve. They want to know that they're, they're meeting whatever the standard is. And that's why a lot of people would agree today that, oh, you know, love is so important. That if we look at the common thing among all religions, it's this idea of love. But most of the people who believe that want to keep the definition too vague or too specific. Most of them want to keep it too vague. They just want to have a general sense of love. That's why you can say stuff like, love wins, love is love. You can say things like that and everybody goes, oh yeah, that sounds really good because we never define our terms. We never say what these things actually are. And we keep things at a distance. I remember talking to uh, uh, this pastor from another church. Um, he's a Lutheran pastor. And I was at a, at a party, and we were talking about this, and he was more of a, of a pluralist. He was more of the kind of person who believed that like, all religions are basically the same, even though he thought he was a Christian. And I started talking to him, and then other people started listening in, and I would, I told him, you know, the problem I have with that view is that, is that it's kind of like if we were standing on the beach looking out at the horizon and there was a, there was a, there was a boat out there, a ship out there, and standing on the deck of the ship was, you know, um, Shaquille O'Neal, some of you guys might remember him, big seven foot tall basketball player, big dude. You know, then there was, you know, Musashi Maru, some big sumo wrestler standing next to him, right? And then 
you know, next to him, you know, would have been, you know, some figure skater or gymnast or something else. And, and they're all the way on the horizon. And as long as they're on the horizon, we can't tell the difference. All we know is if we can see them is they all look the same. They all look like human beings. But we know if they were standing right here in front of us, we would see huge differences between them. Huge differences. But instead, we keep them far enough away, we go, it's all the same. It's all the same, it's all the same. I think before we can ever say something is all the same, we need to get close. And we really need to understand what love means in the Bible. If we believe the Bible is truth, it's God's revelation to us, we need to know what love means in Scripture, in the Bible. What does Jesus mean by that? It's not some general, ambiguous thing. It's rather specific, but not overly so. So, Jesus is teaching the people how to be disciples. And here's what he says to them in Matthew 5, verses 17 through 20. He says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. It's crazy. It's kind of radical stuff Jesus is saying. I thought Jesus came to do something different. I thought he came to set us free from the law. And now he's saying, no, not one bit of the law is going to pass away. How can that be? And again, it confused me. And it confused me even more if you look at that last verse that he says, where he says, your righteousness, your righteousness is going to exceed, it has to exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees. Most of us don't really, haven't really understood the Pharisees. Because we see Jesus calling them out. He calls them hypocrites. He calls them different things like sepulchers and things like that. He, he, has a, he, he seems to be challenging them all the time. And we get the wrong idea. And the wrong idea is this. The people there did not think the Pharisees were hypocrites. They thought the Pharisees were awesome. They wanted to be the Pharisees. They thought the Pharisees were, were, were so faithful and so righteous and so knowledgeable. They didn't see them as hypocrites. Their commitment to the faith far exceeded the common person's commitment. And so when Jesus tells them, your righteousness has to exceed their righteousness, the people listening would have been like, what is he talking about? That's crazy. These are their heroes. And he's saying, you have to be, your righteousness has to surpass your hero's righteousness. Again, how can Jesus say this? I thought he came for to, to, to do away with the law. He came to bring us under grace. Well, here's what changes. And we'll talk about how this change takes place. But here's what changes. What changes is not the law. And what changes is not God. But what changes is us and our relationship to the law. That's what changes. You see... It's difficult sometimes to go back and understand exactly what Jesus meant by law, okay? We know he meant scriptures from the Old Testament, but we're not 100% sure all the time. There's disagreements, arguments over what did he mean by law. But not to go into those arguments today, just 
for our sake, we're just gonna we're just gonna focus on what we call the Ten Commandments. We're gonna focus on that as as the law that Jesus is talking about today, and not get into the other discussions because everybody agrees on that. All the Christian scholars agree on that. So, what changes? Changes is our relationship. And this is what happens. Law, the law, gives the specifics of the expressions of love. The law tells us how we express love. We don't think about it that way. We think about law as um, just these things that I think some of them are good ideas, some of them are bad ideas. But we don't think about law as expressions of love. Even our laws, like, the only time I started really thinking about this, uh, like speed limit laws, or tra- you know, driving safety laws, the only time I started thinking about it was when I had kids. And when I had kids and I would be driving and someone's doing something dangerous on the freeway, I would get so upset at them, not because they were doing something dangerous, but because they had decided that their extra 10 seconds was worth risking the life of my children. And they weren't obeying the law. They weren't thinking about that. They were just thinking about, hey, that's, you know, that's the rules, that's the, but I'm going to break them because I can. But if we actually think that laws, even speed limit and you know, other laws out there, are meant to help us have a better society, a good society, to show that we care about other people, changes. Now I'm not going to be so you know, driving so fast because I'm late for an appointment, and I'm going to risk people's lives weaving in and out of traffic and rolling through stop signs just so I can get somewhere. Because I'm actually thinking and loving the people in the other cars around me. Again, we don't think like that. That's like, that's, that's weird stuff. That's different. And honestly, I only started thinking about it when I had kids. And I didn't think about it when I was doing it, like, Oh, I obviously don't care about that. People say, I only thought about it when it affected me and my children. But that's what Jesus is saying. He's saying the law, it tells us how to express love. But he wants to make sure that we understand that the law does not take the place of love. You cannot just keep the law and say that proves that I love. I'll give you an example here in church. You cannot just come to church and you cannot just, you know, give an offering or you cannot just show up at different things and volunteer to help and say that proves that I love. That takes the place of of love. No. Love is expressed in our relationships to one another. If we're not developing our relationships, If we're not developing this word that I'm kind of uncomfortable with, and I'm sure some of you might be uncomfortable with, if we're not developing a greater intimacy with each other, it's not love. We're just like the Pharisees doing all the right things, but for the wrong reasons. You know, at a church we're at on the mainland, a small church, um, the you know, one of the church members brought this up. And she said, you know, what we need to do is we need to know each other's stories. We need to know each other's stories. Not just the story about how you became a Christian. We need to know each other's stories. Some of you grew up in this area and you've been at this church for, you know, before there was a Kahala Ma and before there was a, you know, a freeway over there and things like that. Some of you have been together like that. And some of you might know a lot about how some, you know, the, you know, family life, brothers and sisters, uh, work experience, et cetera, et cetera. But a lot of you have come to the church um, more recently. And do we know each other's stories? Are there things that will come up that, that would really surprise us? To know, like, you you used to ride horses, or you were a professional bowler, or, I don't know, 
Um, you know, we don't know. Because that's not what church has been for us. Church hasn't been about being a community. Communities, we know each other, good and bad. I used to be in a small town. And, you know, the bad thing about small towns is everybody knows your parents. And if you're going to do something and you want to get away with it, you better find a place far, far away from anybody else in that small town because somehow it's going to get back to your parents. But we should know each other. We should tell each other stories. We actually used to do this in the other church where um, we would have like small groups and, you know, and Bible study times and, and one person every week would share something about their story, something about their lives. Didn't have to be how they became a Christian. It could have been, but it could have been anything. Do we know each other's stories? Let's start with an easier thing. Do we know each other's names? That's a challenge. Do we know each other's names? After we know each other's names, do we know each other's marital status? Do we know what schools? Do we know what jobs? Just the basics. We know that about people that aren't even at the church. But do we know those things about each other? Do we tell these stories? Do we understand that, that it's not enough just to, to, to show up at the program? It's not enough just to, to follow the rules or, or you know, to keep all the rituals? That the church is fundamentally a community of faith that's growing in its love, not just for God, but for each other. We all get this. If I'm going to love God more, I have to understand him more. We all get that. Well, guess what? If you're going to love each other more, you have to understand each other more. I learned so much about church when we were doing our church to work with the special needs families. And, you know, I thought when I first started... I knew I didn't know everything about special needs and special needs families, but I thought I knew enough. But as we started doing this, I realized I really didn't know anything at all. And that if I was ever going to, to minister successfully to, to families that had children with special needs, I needed to understand them. I needed to know their stories. I needed to know what they're going through. One of the questions I asked at the marriage conference last night, uh, yesterday morning to our couples, was I, I had asked them, you know, what is your, in the different stages of life, what is, your, what is your biggest fear? What is your biggest concern right now? Let me tell you what the biggest fear, the biggest fear of parents of children of special needs is. Here's the biggest fear, that their children will outlive them. Do you, do you understand that? If that doesn't like whack you upside the head, if that doesn't turn up something, it's the exact opposite of what we want. We, we want our children to outlive us. We want to leave this world looking at our children, having grown up, maybe raising children of their own. We want to see it continue. But these parents are terrified of their children outliving them. And the reason is, is because they don't know who's going to take care of them. They don't want their kid to be stuck in an institution or put with family members who don't understand what they're going through. Do you understand? If you understand that, it changes how you, how you interact with these people. It changes how you think about how you can love them and how you can serve them. And we all have stories. We all have stories. We all have things that, to us, make perfect sense, but don't make sense to anybody else. I have a daughter who's terrified of spiders. Not for the reasons you think. You might think like, oh yeah, they're scary, creepy, crawly. 
But no, it's because when she was younger, she was playing with and kind of killed several daddy long legs, which aren't technically spiders. And then she was afraid that the daddy long legs family was going to come after her. To this day, she's terrified of spiders. I told her, if a spider dropped in your car, what are you going to do? You're going to just drive off the road? She goes, yeah, exactly what I'm going to do. We all have stories. We all have things that people can't possibly guess about us. We need to know. We all have gifts. You know, we all have things that we can do that you, you may be sitting around going, well, I'll do them if somebody asks me. That's not what a community does. That's what I loved about Eunice. I never asked Eunice for a lay. I never asked her. She just did it. Just did it. You don't have to always ask or always be asked. Sometimes we volunteer. Sometimes you say, this is something I can do. How can you use it? I love going on trips to Haiti because in Haiti, people can use, in Haiti, they can use just about anything. So whenever I'd meet with a team the first time, I would tell them, look, we have certain things planned. But there's a lot of stuff we don't have planned because it's going to depend on what you can do and what you can bring. And every trip was different because every group had different things they could do. You know, we had a guy who was like a handyman mechanic, and they just loved him. He spent almost the whole week fixing everything. In fact, he was kind of bummed near the end of the week, and he's like, man, can I go to one of these evangelism sports camps? I, you know, and I said, yeah, go. But they would, have, they would have kept him there. They just loved what he did. This, this other woman knew how to do crafts, and so she did the crafts. And she, she actually was showing these women that were in a sewing class how to do, make jewelry out of copper. And you had, you had other people that knew music. And so we would do music workshops. And then, you know, another guy came, and he's a... He was a farmer, a rancher in Texas, and so he went and, and he looked at the soil and he took some soil samples to go figure out how to help them with their crops. Just depended on what their skills were. And we're in situations like that. What we know is like they can use anything we have. And I love that. You see, this idea of relationships isn't just like an idea. It's really fundamentally what we're about. And when Jesus says, I haven't come to abolish the law, he says, I've come to fulfill the law. I've come to fulfill the law. And what he means by that is something is going to happen. Something is going to happen. And Jesus is telling him, this is what's going to happen. Up until this time, you have thought about the law as something outside yourself. The Ten Commandments on stone tablets. That's what you've thought. And here you are, looking at those tablets. God has given them to you. And he's saying, if you want to relate to me and relate to one another better, you know, this is the way. And so what happens, though, is, is we take our eyes off God and we turn our eyes to the tablets. It's a problem. When we turn our eyes to the tablets, when we turn our eyes to the law, whatever that law is, we take our eyes off God. And we also find out something. That as long as it's an external code, it's impossible to keep. Jesus is going to talk about this more later. Because he's going to say, it's not enough just not to murder people. He says, you can't even hate them. He's going to say it's not enough just not to have committed adultery. He's saying you shouldn't even be lusting. And he's only using those two examples, but it can be extended to anything. It's not just what we actually do, it's what we're thinking. It's the great challenge for the church. It's the great challenge that's been 
happening for the last 50, 60 years, and it's only going to increase with this increase in an ability to, to bring information into our lives, to, to connect with the world and, and all of the entertainment and the media that goes on, that our, that our, our children and even we ourselves have been so shaped by these outside forces. We've been so shaped by, by these things that, that even if we know that's the wrong thing to do, we still think about it. And we still think if we had the right opportunity, we'd do it. Jesus came to fulfill the law. Well, you go, well, if the law's outside, then what's he going to do? Well, as Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 3, and, and the author of Hebrews writes in chapter 8, verse 10, he says, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. This is what happens. The code is no longer outside. The law is no longer outside. It's written in our hearts. We follow the law not because some code says follow. We follow the law because it's inside of us. It's who we are now. We don't murder because there's a law that says don't murder. We don't murder because it's not within our nature to murder. It goes against it. It's inside of us. And if that's the case, then the law is still there. The law is fulfilled. But now it's connected to who we are. And that impossible thing of keeping the law perfectly or keeping the law with the right motivation, the right attitude, the attitude of perfect love, that impossibility becomes possible because the law is written in our hearts. And that's the thing, is that disciples follow God's law for the right reasons. If you're a disciple, you do what God says. You come here on a Sunday morning. You read your Bible. You go to Bible studies. You serve with one another. You get to know one another. You help one another for the right reasons. And the right reason is simply this. It's an expression of God's eternal love in your life. You know why we should want to be here on a Sunday morning? It's because this is where your family is. If we're really in love with God and our love for God makes us be in love with one another, we should want to be together. I've asked this question and no one's ever given me an answer and you don't have to. But I asked them, when was the last time you came to a worship service and right near the end of the worship service, you were thinking like, oh man, it's over. I am bummed. We were all together. And now we have to go our separate ways. This is kind of depressing. When is the last time that you said, I want it to go on and on and on, instead of, thank God it's over? If we're a family, we shouldn't want it to end. I'm going to tell you, things have been happening over the past few months, and they're not. Um, they, they lead to good problems. For example, more and more people are just hanging out and talking now. They're not just rushing off to go home. In fact, so much so that the Chinese churches, I think at some point they're going to start starting their service while, you know, people over here talking from our service. You know, actually they'll probably kick us out. But they're, they're, it's a good problem. People want to hang out. They want to talk. They want to develop relationships beyond just a good 60 minutes on a Sunday morning. It's a good thing. But we do this for the right reasons. 
We don't pick up God's word and read it because, you know, it's what good Christians do. No, we pick it up because it's God's letter to us. God reveals himself to us. And we do it because we love him. And if we love him, we want to know him. That's why we, we want Bible studies. And if you think like, well, the Bible studies we have here, they're too up here. I don't, I don't get it. Okay, come talk. And we'll find a Bible study at whatever level you're at, wherever you're ready to grow. We'll help you. And you might go, well, you know, the Bible studies are too basic. Okay. Meet with me. If you can, if I can't meet your expectations of how deep you want to understand theology or understand scripture, I'll find somebody who can. But we shouldn't have excuses if we're doing things for the right reasons. And when the law is written on our hearts, we do these things for the right reasons. We do them because of God's love in our lives that overflows. And that's why all that disciples do, all disciples do when they're doing things God's way is from God's love. And a lot of the specifics of what we do is found in his law. And again, I've talked about this a little bit before, but we do always need to draw the distinction between love and the expressions of love. And we need to know that our, our source should be God's eternal love. And we need to understand what God's love is, which again, which reason we need to study. But we also need to know that the expressions of love, they're not always going to be the same. They're going to change in different situations. Now, God's word gives us laws that never change. It is never okay to murder. It is never okay to commit adultery. It makes it pretty clear. But there's a lot of expressions of love that are going to depend on the, the situation and the person. But it's motivated by love. So how do we keep the law? How do we keep the law? Because most of us know when we became Christians, we didn't really understand things. We didn't have the benefit of having grown up and being trained like Paul was trained in, in, to be a Pharisee. We don't really know God's law. Well, that's step one. Know God's law. When, you're, when you first start out as a Christian and you first start out on this journey or when you first try to understand this, you just do it because you trust God says to do it. You don't do it because you trust God says don't do it. I've used this example before, but, you know, when my kids were two or three, it wasn't about explaining to them the rules. It was just telling them these are the rules. And if I told my daughter, don't put anything in the electric socket, that's the rule. And you came to my house when she was two or three and and you were about to plug in the blender, and she goes, don't do that. Daddy said don't put anything in the electric socket. You would think it was cute, and you would maybe get a chuckle out of it. But if you came to my house now, and my oldest daughter's 24, and you were about to plug the blender in, and my 24-year-old daughter said, don't do that. My daddy said don't put anything into that socket. You wouldn't laugh. You'd be kind of sad. Because a 24-year-old is expected to understand things that a 2- and 3-year-old is not. So sometimes we just keep the law and we trust that God has a reason. We keep it for whatever reason. We don't even necessarily have to have a good reason when we first are growing in our faith. And what happens along the way is, is we don't just want to learn about God's law. We also want to know God's love. We want to understand what it is and we want to be able to experience it. And ultimately what we want to grow up to is we want to grow up to people who keep God's law because it comes from our love for God. But here's the thing. 
not everything is addressed in God's law. So what do we do? What do we do when, when it doesn't seem like, like we really know what it, the Bible might be teaching about something? I'm just going to rush through this, but let me give you three things. You can look up these scriptures later, but in James chapter 2, verses 14 through 17, These verses are interesting. It says, if someone comes to you with a need and you just say, oh, bless you, go and be blessed, and you don't meet the need, James is saying, what kind of faith do you have? You certainly don't have a faith that expresses love. So the first thing from James 2, what we see is when we don't know what to do, we need to address the immediate need. Of course, you've got to know that it's actually a need but you address the immediate need. You try to deal with the immediate need. The second we find in Matthew 25, verses 31 to 46, and this is where Jesus is giving this this parable on this long story about the judgment that's going to come, the judgment of the sheep and the goats. And he says that the ones who will be accepted They will be considered faithful servants. Are those who meet the needs of others as unto Jesus. When you don't know what to do, think about, okay, how do I love this person in a way that it would be like I'm loving Jesus? How do I do that? Now, Matthew 25 is specifically talking about loving ministering within the church. I think it can extend beyond there, but I think we need to get it right in the church. When, when someone is, has a need, when someone is struggling, when someone even is, is, is upset or disagreeing, are we trying to love them and take action as though we were doing it unto Jesus. And then John 13, 35, he tells us that our great testimony, our great witness to the world, is the love that we have for one another. And here's what I, some will say, is that if you get stuck and you're not sure exactly what to do, Ask yourself, what would God's love have me do in this situation? You might be wrong. You might do something incredibly stupid. But at least you did it for the right reasons. At least you did it motivated from God's love. I would rather us do things wrong motivated by God's love than do things right and motivated by anything else. Oh, the other way leads to a lot of sometimes success. The the way of any other motivation, as long as you do it, leads to success. But it's really not what we're supposed to be, and it really doesn't demonstrate the witness that Christ has called us to have. Our witness... Yes, it's words. We need words. What the Bible tells us is that our greatest witness is the love we have for each other. The love we have for each other. We should love each other so well. And we should love each other loudly so that the world can see and the world can hear, not to show off, not to say, look how awesome we are, but because it's what the world needs. And we think there's, some, there's something like noble about being like secret and quiet and private. There's not. The world doesn't need more people standing on soapboxes yelling. It doesn't need more Christians telling people they're going to hell. What it needs is more Christians authentically living this supernatural love together in the church in such a way that the world cannot help but take notice.
And the reason, the reason we can do that is because God's law, if we're believers in Christ, is written on our hearts. And you might ask, why does God want the law written on our hearts? Well, he wants it written on our hearts because it's written on his heart. The law is not an external code to God. The law is expression of who he is. And so, yes, we need to know the law. We need to keep the law. But we need to keep the law for the right reasons. We need to be disciples, but we need to be disciples motivated by the right reasons. And our prayer is that we would be able to follow the law of God's love and how we love him and how we love one another.